That's the bridge view, which is the central job location. It's, dis it's and is distinguishable from the bridge, not in complement, but as an eyesore of imitation materials. Uh, this, is, this is a disruption of the rhythm and flow of the street and is that relevant to the suggested guidelines for the construction concerning section 2-II uh, with regard to transitions in building mass and form. While it is similar in height, it is a special interest that this obscures the view. Um, this obscures the view. This is also relevant to principle number four of the standards of preservation with regard to the fact that um, a property may require historic significance in sunlight and uh, should be preserved or obtained. Um, this is relevant to the location uh, status as the most integrable location in San Antonio. And while that sounds you know, somewhat flippant, um, you have to understand that uh, accessible internet populations have grown from 1.5 billion uh, over the past 10 years to about 3.2 billion overall. And each one of these successes that Finn's on used to document the time here on this bridge is a snapshot and an advertisement for a future uh, population and investment. Continuing with the guidelines for new construction, um, we have section three, um, our parts I, 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 and B, or I guess I'll say one, two, five, concerning complementary materials, alternative use of traditional materials, and imitation or synthetic materials. Um, as it stands, the current components of this project do not do not incorporate materials that are uh, in architectural harmony with the surrounding area. Given that this is uh, it, the only development of this kind, a, a large mixed-use residential unit on a more or less single residence street, um, it should be a little bit more cohesive with the surrounding area. For instance, Article B of that same um, concerning the use of historic materials stipulates that. Uh, New designs can incorporate themes from the bridge itself. Um, the developer has said in multiple times that he's heard our concerns and seeks to incorporate them. However, several days since have been mentioned of the fact that the bridge is constructed from the same steel as the Eiffel Tower. Um, we did not see that steel reflected here. Instead, we saw oxidized metals, we saw bricks. Um, these are actually um, materials that are named explicitly in Section 5 of Article 3 concerning the new uh, guidelines of construction as. Um, simulated stone veneers and contemporary materials that are not traditionally used in the district. Um, they don't have the they don't have an architectural tie into the region and so it's as imposing as the developers claim to the area. Um, concerning architectural um, number four of that same uh, section concerning our uh, section eight historical context, um, the design of the building should reflect the time or respect the historic context. Um, and we fail to see that here. We fail to see the spirit of technology reflected um, Affordability of the bridge has been referenced several times, um, much of the dismay of architecture. However, we have to understand that architecture is unique for its inherent social and utilitarian value. Um, the effort before us is not an imaginative effort. It's one of arrogant entitlement. Uh, it's an uninspired design of this very, this very selling point is the property that it's obstruction. We've heard some support for this design with the hopes that it will stifle crime. We share those same concerns. Um, in fact, Bruce Franklin has personally advocated to our councilman for an insurmountable in the area. However, this it's not cookie cutter development that resolves this. Um, Austrian architect Adolf Loos argues in his 1908 essay, Ornament and Crime, that wasted labor power and hence wasted wealth or ornament is what perpetuates the poor conditions, low wages, and long hours that foster crime. In this respect, affordability is relevant as a design issue to the interests of crime raised on both sides of this community. Um, Moreover, the pseudo brutalism of the street layer of the, of the building concerning the brick facades, the, the external material here, um, is sort of re it's reminiscent of um, brutalism. What I'm trying to say is art, architecture doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, it's subject to the attitudes surrounding it. For instance, in 2016, Zara Hadid claimed an award. Uh, she's an Indian architecture concerning uh, for her work as an architect um, concerning like, the Marxist building in Rome. These were really ambitious, um, brutalism-based projects, but they were largely in elite interest, and um, they weren't really community accessible. Um, when you compare that to the 2018 um, winner of that same award, Balkanish Doshi, um, it incorporates the communal space, open area, green space, and sustainability, the same sorts of elements that we feel to see present in this current design. Um, for modernist architects that follow loose, creating affordable housing for workers was a moral imperative that fundamentally altered the character of society. At the height of their careers, architects like the like the Cavoisier, Walter Krukius, and Bruno Tons and Ennio Goldfinger were still designing large-scale housing projects that incorporated affordability as an urgent uh, need because they understood its relevance its the socioeconomic impacts. They understood that it's so important to ingratiate yourself into the fabric of community. 
not necessarily deteriorate. Um, the architectural references that we're using here span a couple of decades in styles, but judging from these designs, I don't believe Maya's team is familiar with even one of them. And even if they are, that influence is not present in these materials. What um, is all the more embarrassing for a case which this much oh, well, I mean, that's all the more embarrassing for a case with this much scrutiny. Uh, this is not Maya's first property. In fact, he has drawn wide criticism for neglect that left Aurora apartments infested with bed bugs and subject to fire hazards. Um, this is to say, if he is allowed to cut corners now on paper, he will make every effort to do so in the future. Um, that's right. Next we have Susana Segura, followed by Graciela Zanda. Hello, my name is Susana Segura. I'm from District 4. I don't live in the neighborhood, but that bridge does belong to all of us. It is on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, what I see in these new and improved drawings that came before us is basically Mitch trying to do the same thing he did last time, a residential complex uh, and avoid underground parking. We keep coming before you and speaking on behalf of the bridge and the view shed. It is well within the purview of the Historic Design Review Commission to take into consideration that the view shed should be protected from this bridge, uh, never mind that the land is still in litigation. Uh, never mind that you know the community has worked so hard to preserve and save this bridge and to raise money. Um, never mind that Eugene Seymour has the same history of going after National Register of Historic Places uh, buildings, including the Frederick and the Merchants Heights building, uh, both failed attempts at <coughs> building development. Uh, <coughs> You know, we, we just keep coming before you and we keep asking you to please protect the view of the bridge. Everybody um, wants to see this bridge preserved, but we also want to see the bridge uh, the way it looks now, without development on that corner, without that height. You know, it goes from four to five, and that's just way too high. It, it just blocks the entire view. Um, there's also a possibility that in the future, the land that Eugene Seymour owns that is currently parking lot will come before you as a different apartment complex development building. So please also take that into consideration. Uh, I have no doubt that if this uh, does get approved for construction and if Mitch Myers is able to qualify for all of the city incentives that may be available for his construction, including the $25 square foot uh, mixed use incentive from the Center City Development Office. Uh, I have no doubt that Eugene Seymour will try to build something on that line. Thank you. Next we have Graciela Sanchez. Graciela has six students here. Um, Enrique Sanchez and Isabel Sanchez, both here with him. Yes, my name is Graciela Sanchez. I am from 233 Lotus in District 1 with the Esperanza the Westside Preservation Alliance and also a member of the Midtown and Westside Planning Advisory Committees, working to make decisions for the future of San Antonio. I also raise concerns at these meetings because I feel like here I'm giving time and energy like you all, and I never know for all the time and energy we spend thinking of the future if they'll actually honor it. I want to begin by honoring Doug Stedman, as many others have. Many people have given him five years, ten years, but this is a, a, a letter to the editor dated November 2nd, 1967. He states, as a native of San Antonio, I think clean and paint up for hemisphere is a good slogan. However, I can't see how our city officials and our chamber of commerce can be satisfied with this slogan when our Hay Street Bridge is becoming a death trap and is always so full of rubbish and broken bottles and has its railings deteriorated. I think the bridge should be painted and lighted up at night and kept clean, especially now that Hemisphere will soon be opening. He was 40 years old. As you know, he died a couple of weeks ago at age 91. 
That's how dedicated he was. And he did find that land, and he did get it donated to the city. And he, as his son said, he was very angry at the end. I mean, to be angry when you die because you, you, you lost that land for the view of the bridge. That was so important. Uh, next slide. There, there are several bridges that connect communities together because of the, our famous uh, railroad tracks that have surrounded San Antonio for over 100 years. This is the view of Commerce Street Bridge. Next. Uh, they gave these this railroad systems were instrumental in building this country in San Antonio. They gave us jobs, they trans they transport and continue to tra transport goods and services and people. In the 20th century and even today, trains can also cause delays when folks have to wait around when they pass through intersections or even stop for long periods of time or even hours, as we know in this west side. So that's why they built the, built the bridges. But these are the Buena Vista, Commerce, New Brownholds, Guadalupe Street were built in the 50s and 60s. And they're not beautiful. They're not anything exceptional. They are what they are, just using, usable for moving of people. And, and that's why it's so hard uh, to see, you know, how then the historic Hay Street Bridge Built in 19, I mean, brought to the space in 1910. First for both horse and buggies, then cars, and now hikers, bikers, and regular folks walking and running or pushing strollers. They are taking graduation and wedding pictures and just scenic photographs of themselves, their families, and friends. They are photographing the downtown skyline, but they are also taking photos of the architectural beauty of the bridge and the small little wood frame homes on the northeast side of the bridge. This is the beautiful and unique San Antonio community that we love and need to preserve. Into which the developers proposed to drop an entirely inappropriate apartment complex. The downtown decide guidelines that we states that we must create a neighborhood identity, a sense of place, which gives in the neighborhood a unique character, enhancing the walking environment and, and creates pride in the community. These are the words that are in the design. Uh, downtown design. This building will destroy the neighborhood identity. We will no longer be able to see the full view of the community from the bridge because the new building will be 72 feet high and re erase the view from the bridge when standing across this new building. Why did the architects or developers give you, give us a view looking towards the building up from the bridge so that we can really appreciate the overwhelming size, the massing, the overwhelming massing of this five-story structure and this environment? Additionally, although not part of the downtown design criteria, when this massive building gets built, what happens to the cool day and night breezes that currently move in and out? That's what I always feel when I get up there and I think, I know what that's like because we've been in it when we're downtown and we have massive buildings on either side. On page 13 of the downtown design criteria, it talks about uh, pedestrian friendly. This is not pedestrian friendly because it can be the site and the retail the question about retail is very problematic they are expected to get 1.2 million dollars in incentives for the chip already and it says 7,000 square feet of, of uh, retail I don't know that there's 7,000 square feet of retail are we agreeing to this without knowing what the, the C chip requirements are um, Citizens need wel uh, welcoming, well-defined public spaces, places to stimulate face-to-face -face interaction, etc., etc. The land below the bridge is the only space that allows for the public space. The current design for public space is so small that only the residents of the apartments or those who drink or hang out at Alamo Beer will have access to this quite limited public space. Actually, this pocket park is more like a dog park. It is very small and just like the current Alamo Beer Company outdoor space, makes people feel outsiders unless they live or come to act to the activity sponsored by the private owner. According to Eugene Seymour at one of his community meetings at the only one happening at the beer company, he says he gets to decide what people get to come in and out of his indoor and outdoor space. And if you, I was there today and you know the outdoor part is closed up have to go into another area. Um, building design, gosh, I'm sorry, some people have said some of this stuff, so I don't. The developer's goal is to make money and move this process quickly as 
move it forward as quickly as possible. If not, then they would have spent the last three months or another extra three months talking to us and engaging with us. They haven't done that. Um, when he was forced to build his brewery on the south side, he went down. His scale to build the Alamo Bridge, uh, Alamo Brewery initially was huge, but now he put that into three separate buildings that are lower than the bridge. So why can't he do and think that way? Thank you very much. Next we have Amy Astley. Amy has six minutes, both uh, Malia, John Geary, and Diane Sines. Go to their time. So my name is Amy Castley. Um, again, I thank you for your service. I am a pro bono attorney for the Hay Street Bridge Restoration Group, and I have been um, since um, 2010. Um, James McKnight, who's the attorney for the um, developer here, uh, was not actually a, an attorney in that case, is not an attorney in the case. The, the only attorney that was there on behalf of Mr. Seymour is actually Cruz Shaw, who is now the council person. Um, so I, I wanted to tell you that um, first, please, please know that um, Mr. McKnight's request to you that all the developer wants is to be treated like anybody else is, is really um, a little misleading. That is the the developer here, which is the, the owner, as you know, is actually a Three North Jerry LLC, uh, in which Mr. Seymour and Mr. Um, Meyer um, are investors as well as, as others. Um, that group assumed this property um, from the city, knowing full well of this dispute. Moreover, there was a Les um, Pens on file in the land records when they purchased, quote unquote, the land from Mr. Seymour's um, Texas land company to which the city had transferred the land. It was never transferred to Alamo Beer. Um, the, this lawsuit, as you can hear, has been frustrating. And the lawsuit really came about because uh, community oriented volunteers trusted the city government. They were assured, you heard from Mr. Stedman's son, they were assured that this land would be held until we had raised the money to develop it. So trusting the government is a good thing, particularly by people who want to improve their communities. It's also true, and it's no surprise, that the statutory law, particularly the statutory law that comes out of Austin, is very much favored, favorable to the wealthy and the influential and the politically influential. We know that. Your role in this legal regime is to bring wisdom and reason to the application of these laws that have been given us that we're kind of stuck with. And it's not true that merely because we're a crowd, we're wrong about the law. We're not. As you know, and as you've heard, and I know Councilwoman uh, Kamal at the last meeting, as well as others, said the concern about the impact on the Hay Street Bridge of this development is very much within our um, purview. And I know that you've been pressured. Mr. McKnight announced to the community about the letter that had been sent by the city attorney and the office of historic preservation to each of you, warning you that you must not consider all these other issues that the crowd is bringing to you. But that's not, that's, that's an inaccurate portrayal of our input. What we're saying is that the Hay Street Bridge has been a historically designated, historically significant structure since 1987. The city has failed to record those things but, but the um, 
developer was well aware of that when he came and when they came to this property. Moreover, the guidelines that you are asked to apply with reason and wisdom do not uniformly favor the developer. Just because we're the crowd and they're the developer does not mean that they're right. The, the um, guidelines that you are charged to apply include, as we've talked about, the mass of this building. And in particular, if I may read from the downtown guidelines, um, monolithic slab-like structures that wall off views and overshadow the surrounding neighborhood are not appropriate. That describes this project. It is appropriate for you to say part of this historical district is its proximity to the historical engineering uh, landmark of the Hay Street Bridge. The, there are um, structures and there are there is development that could maintain the um, community and the neighborhoods access to this culturally and engineeringly and historically significant. Um, building. And those could be, as the developer mentioned in their presentation, low buildings that are appropriate to the area, retail buildings that are appropriate to the area, but not a building that locks the iconic bridge of the of view of the Hay Street Bridge. Um, I, I wanted to mention also that the um, the rule um, in, let's see, I'm not going to quote all these provisions to you, but um, overall under section chapter 5, um, the um, encouragement of neighborhood activity, just as, oh, thank you, just as um, the, count, the um, commission members mentioned in December, the idea that this is a mixed use um, project is a farce. Um, and the idea that this will encourage pedestrian and retail action um, is not true. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Natalie Rodriguez, and I live at 4400 Horizon Hill Boulevard. I am going to start off um, talking about the petitions. We do, there's an online petition that has over 15,000 um, signatures. Um, a lot of them are local, but a lot of them are also um, in the United States and out of the United States. And so I'm going to read a comment. Um, from our woman Bianca Diaz um, regarding um, signatures that come from out of San Antonio because this is um, a very important um, issue to people here, but it is a people issue and national issue um, to protect the historic bridge. Several people did not give us their stories, but have taken a stance against gentrification by signing the petition to fight for public access to the bridge. This is not just a local issue. People from all over the world have added their names in solidarity with our mission to protect the historic bridge. These people are from Greece, Spain, Italy, British Columbia, South Africa, Germany, Switzerland, Sweden, the United Kingdom, Brazil, France, Venezuela, Quebec, Nova Scotia, Ireland, and more countries, other, others throughout the US, have also added their names. This is not just a local issue, it's a national issue. If so many around the world seem to understand this, why can't San Antonio's own of city officials? I'm going to continue reading um, comments, other comments from the community members who could not make it. Um, this is from an anonymous person because of the unique history and structure of the bridge. I believe it should remain open to the public. In the past, it was the main artery linking the east side to downtown, safely getting residents over the railroad tracks. It can still bring citizens together today as 
They enjoy various public activities there with this beautiful view of the city. Its unique architectural structure reflects the unique, unique history of our city. It should remain open to the public and not to be degraded to be merely part of one company's property for only their own advantage and income. From Margaret in Texas, we don't have many destination points that bring out the true cultural and historical beauty of the east side, the Hay Street Bridge is one. Nora from Texas, Nora P. from Texas. I value the saving of historic places. After the work to restore it, the bridge should remain accessible to all. That should not be incompatible with commercial interests. From John K., this is a historic bridge structure that was saved and rehabilitated by with federal, state, and city funds as a public monument of our past and as a history lesson to this generation about how we lived and how this unique type bridge was part of our transportation infrastructure that needs to be shared with future generations. Susie from Texas, I live in the neighborhood I vote, and this is an encroachment of developers against the will of people who live in the neighborhood. The developers do not care about our neighborhood because they are not our neighbors. From an anonymous person, because of the unique history and structure of the bridge, I believe it should remain open to the public and the past of the oh. Yikes. That's not a familiar term. As stated, the Acacia Bridge is a link between downtown and the adjacent east side neighborhoods. It also has historical importance linking the industrial age to the more agrarian founding of our city. The view and sense of being connected to the other parts of San Antonio in many aspects should be afforded to all citizens, not just a small percentage of newcomers to our city. From Naomi in Texas, it is a historic symbol not only bridging the city's neighborhoods, but also a symbol of bridging the racial divide. From Vanessa in Texas, this is, abs this is absurd that public property seemed for a recreational park should be sold at the gain of an interest of the city, realtors, and Alamo Brewery. This all has already happened in Southtown. All the people have been pushed out of their homes and apartments with, whose facade may appear nice, but are of shoddy construction have gone up. The price gouging on these apartments and condos is also a token. That's time. Thank you. For your time. <laughs> Next we have Crystal Fonte. She has six minutes. Um, Eliza Perez and Alicia. I don't know. Yes, sorry. <laughs> uh, both here with their time. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Christelle A. I work at Puente. I live at 431 Fir. My great-grandmother um, lived on Pine. My grandparents lived on Rosen. Thank you all for being here today. Um, my biggest issue is blocking the most beautiful view of our city and the Hay Street Bridge. Um, the scale of this building is raised approximately 20 feet. This building is out of scale and not consistent with the historic neighborhood around it. Uh, according to the Downtown Design Guide, Design Excellence is the foundation of successful and healthy communities. This is the view that we will lose. And it's on these papers right here, so you can really take a good look at it. Um, so as we're talking about the design itself, um, the Z-shape narrowing by the bridge is in a downtown or historic pattern. It adds no value for urban walking, especially shared spaces with walkers and bikers. City's downtown design standards do not meet bulb outs, and the suggestion in the design illustrates that developers do not understand good urban design. What is needed is larger sidewalks. This affects walkability, and the setback, it should have a further setback, and the sidewalk should be 10 feet. I also see no coverings for air conditioning or outside trash bins or recycle bins addressed. Sorry. The awning should wrap around the building even until Lamar. Lamar looks like an afterthought. A larger 10-foot sidewalk is needed on Cherry and Lamar to accommodate for comfortability and loading and walking for via buses, car share, moving vans, and walkability. I did notice there were open terraces that looked like they were for residents to view the bridge. Are these open to the public or are they indeed private? The C-shaped parking lot is not acceptable for a view to have from the bridge. 360 degree views from the bridge should be considered. The scale of the building is problematic, considering that it cuts off the view of the bridge from historic homes and the neighborhood itself to the bridge. And there should be a minimum of 141 parking spaces. I only counted 76. If two targeted, targeted millennials live in a studio, they will need to have two spaces, even though they both want to, walk, want to buy. They still need a car in Texas because we do not fund easy public transportation. Obviously, one two bedroom tenants will need a space. Retail establishment will need a space. Local residents and visitors to the bridge will need a space, space to park. How will this work? Will tenants be forced to walk far away and park underneath the expressway? Maybe tenants who want urban living will want to take a bike to work or take public transit. Very well then. The, next, the, the nearest bus stops are unknown. There are subpar via services for Ella Austin, and when they have events there, driving and parking that overflows into the neighborhood is an issue. The city and VIA need to come up with a plan for Cherry Lamar route that links this area with the rest of downtown. Loop B Limited should be forced to commit in writing to fund transportation options before any thought of approval for this design, especially if they are selling the lack of parking to HDRC under the guise that millennials will mostly want to take public transit. A brewery then coupled with a new restaurant are now proposed in a high-density housing zone where there are already at least two other bars in a close proximity of each other. Big urban cities do not approve liquor licenses or high-density downtown housing without a proposal for public transportation. Why? Congestion and DUIs. This area with expected new business and especially several serving alcohol is a danger to residents and patrons and will face consequences of DUI offenders. Will this be an area police will increase patrols to prevent those drinking and driving? Will tenants who can't find parking late at night have to park under an expressway, walk over train tracks, walk past a bar parking lot, down streets with poor lighting and iffy sidewalks, with fear of dodging impaired drivers on their walk home? There should be a serious look at the lack of parking and the need for bus loading zones with seating, shelter, and trash cans, sidewalk passing, and walking space. The Pearl. The problem with the nationwide success of the Pearl is that now every developer wants to ride the coattails of that success. And instead of pushing for a creative design, the study needs design and studying the needs of developer neighborhoods, they are content to the copy and paste formula. The Pearl, while considering the success and business model, design wise, it's with scale a mistake was made. The new buildings dwarf the original Pearl design, which stood out as you can see the northwest view from Hay Street Bridge or opposite from the river. As for design of this building, this is not a good option for a historic neighborhood. The corner of LeBarn and Cherry could be another cut and paste from Pearl, Savalas Lofts, or even the first design presented. The two small retail spaces is not going to be crowds and success like the Pearl has had. Perhaps the issues with the guidelines themselves 
which in the strategic framework plan that was working in, in SA 2020 for 2012, the city has grown and is pushing the boundaries of downtown. The needs of neighborhoods have changed. Although the design, downtown design guide leaves room for innovative design, and even states it and encourages it, I ask, is HDRC and the city really promoting this to developers where it counts for them, which for developers like Seymour and Myers indicate is monetarily. The answer is in similarity of designs we are seeing getting approved with HDRC. It is time to take another look at the downtown design guide and how we incentivize developers and what are we incentivizing them for. This leads me to offering a solution. I don't want to be considered um, an obstructionist, as a lot of us often are. Um, through my research, I found the container park in Las Vegas. When I looked up the container park, um, I realized that maybe instead of developers trying to create another pearl with every design presented to HDRC, maybe they should be looking to other successful models for downtown development and other That's tourist fine. revenue cities implemented. Um, I do have one last comment I'd like to make. Uh, on a final note, as an artist, the sky cards are a sad attempt at art. Again, the ignorance of the developer telling the people this is the art you get, it's vintage. Right. Instead so of what you might be more appropriate with the city, the, the cards now. are not each so side or special you architecture of the bridge. Yes, maybe long-time residents would really love please, a visual please reminder wrap up your remarks. of the displacement of the neighborhood please, in 1968 that took place to, just blocks away from this location. If this design is passed today, the Sky Card addition to the development will go along nicely with a new 76-foot reminder of the lost promise of Dawson Park that was stolen from us. Next we have Rose Hill, followed by Antonio Diaz. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, I'm going to take all my time. I think a lot of, um, has been said today. I'm the President of Government Hill, a neighbor association. We are neighbors to Dignity Hill. Um, when I look at the Hay Street Bridge, I was born and raised um, on Brooks and Olive. There was one other bridge that we never mentioned, the Brooks and uh, Olive Bridge that was there as I grew up. My mother's died 97 years old. She played with the rosebuds. I wish I could have brought that picture today, where they, all the girls, and if they graduated from Emerson, she's 97, going to be 98, played and took a picture on that bridge. What I hear today, I'm not against development. Luckily, in Government Hill, we've had developers that have come to the table, that have sat down, made their propositions and work with us. We've been we'll agreed to disagree and somehow we'll come together. Today I don't see that happening here. That's very sad. Because regardless of whatever the developers decide to build, they have to stop, they have to look and they have to listen to the hearts of the people that live in that community. The Hay Street Bridge is going to take away a lot of you. But I think that today what I've heard from everybody is there can be a compromise. Why not reduce those to two stories? Let that view still be available. There's got to be some give and take, but you can't give it all away and not give back a little bit. So I think that if I was a developer, which I'm not, and I know they're going to lose money, go back to the drawing table. Talk to these people. Sit down. Stop. Look and listen. Be a good neighbor. And maybe something good can come out of this, but I think that they need to go back to the drawing table. We did it many times before. We might not agree always what they're going to do, but if you can compromise to some extent and listen to what these young kids, because those are our future today. I've heard some fabulous uh, uh, comments on the, on the young millennials here today. I'm 61, and I'm just, I was, I'm over impressed. But you got to stop looking and listen. And the developers, I hope that you will listen and stop looking at this today. That's Maybe right. something might good might come out of this. Thank you. Thank you. Our last citizen we have heard is Antonio Diaz. Mr. Diaz has four minutes. Diana Oriegas, uh, you'll be heard. Thank you all for staying here and listening to everybody. And I know you're more about historical design and all, all that. I'm 
speaking more on the human aspect <coughs> of gentrification. There's uh, been such a move to house people from from the east side. I still have family. I lived in the east side for, for the longest time in big communities. And right now my daughter lives on uh, Burnett, the Broncos, my grandchildren. So uh, I see it as best and interest. Yeah. As uh, prices continue to go up, neighborhoods get dismantled, residents get displaced. That's gentrification to me. And I have not spoken on the uh, Hayes uh, Street Bridge issue because I saw it all as gentrification. That's bringing in more development, higher taxes. Higher real estate uh, costs, which means higher taxation. Even though our city says we don't raise your taxes, but when you when you assess a property higher, your taxes go up. And that is what's going on, and will continue to go on. So, at this point, to me, a green space in part would have less of that impact than a five-story apartment complex with, again, outreaching to retailers to displace more houses in, within those neighborhoods because you would need that space for retailers, for parking and so forth. So all I see is displacement. All I see is gentrification. And higher property assessment, higher costs, and loss of those people that have lived there. Uh, uh, you listen, you're listening to people that have been there since the turn of the uh, 20th century. And they're, they're, they're still there. The families are still there. And they cannot afford high cost. That is a low income area. You speak about affordable housing, you've seen public housing go down. There's no more public housing in there. So you, what you have is mixed income housing now. Not affordable housing. The affordable houses are those wooden frame homes in those neighborhoods that will be torn down because of such development. And I'm here to speak on behalf of my grandchildren, daughter, and other residents that I know within that area that cannot afford to be moved out to other neighborhoods that are just being developed, where those houses are astronomical costs of $150,000, $300,000. That is our wages in San Antonio for the general working person cannot afford that, and more than likely cannot afford this development of the apartments that is being proposed at this point either. So I am in favor of the integrity of the existing neighborhoods surrounding the A Street Bridge, so I am opposed against the development of it. I support the green space and the park that land should have stayed as Mr. Stedman fought for to develop it for the community for a park. I'm Antonio Diaz, an activist in San Antonio, and uh, I can't see, I mean, I know that you, that you all are doing the best you can. Hopefully, you will side with the people's interests and be more stringent with the development. Is uh, that, that I'll cry for retail businesses to move in. It, it, that space that you're talking about, it's imaginary. It's imaginary. It will have to become real, which means displacement, which means houses torn down, the integrity of the neighborhood uh, done away with. So please hold this developer to a, a, a higher standard. Thank you. Observation, and then I have a question um, for either the staff or some of the state legal folks in here. Um, I begin every one of these meetings by reading the chairman's statement, and the last sentence in the first paragraph goes something like this An appeal of a decision by an administrative official can be filed in accordance with the city's unified development code. 
That means no matter which way this goes, um, as I understand it, either the applicant or any citizen can file an appeal um, to, um, to reconsider any decision we make. Um, what I want to remind uh, everyone in the audience about is that uh, this is an advisory body. So our votes are actually considered to the recommendations. Ultimately, they're certified up the food chain. So I'm happy to report that uh, we're very rarely overturned, but sometimes we have to. Um, in the case of one very substantial historic property, we were asked to be listed on the basis of economic hardship. We declined to do that, and the owner was successful in getting it delisted later. Um, what is the method of an appeal if one wanted to make it? Uh, where does that go? Um, appeals of administrative decisions go to the Board of Adjustment. All right, so that's just for your information out there. Um, commissioners, I'm sure we're going to have some discussion. Uh, I'm sorry, can I have a, sorry. But well, in, um, in the it, past, it's actually our turn now. I know. But, but we but may you ask, ask you a You ask the legal question, and, and I'm I don't think that's the You can ask that if you have any questions. So. Mr. Chairman, there is an opportunity um, for the applicant for a brief, like, rebuttal period in the rules of procedure if they wish to take advantage of that. All right. Uh, does the applicant want to make any rebuttal at any particular point? <clears throat> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll make them quick, but I just, there's a few things that I really want to clear up, try to clarify from our point of view. One is the view shed. It keeps referring to, being referred to as the view shed. There is no view shed. There is views of the bridge from the specific spot, and there are views from the bridge from many spots. One of the views of the bridge that's quite important is along uh, Highway 37. Um, this isn't the only place where you can view the bridge, so I think not the idea of referring to as the view shed. Also, there, it's important to remember that there is a view shed process going on right now to create another ordinance, but we have filed our permits prior to that any ordinance being submitted, so we are actually not subject to any ordinance that would be passed on that. Uh, as far as parking goes in the downtown zoning area, there is no parking requirement. So it's referred to from several people that we were under park. It's not true. There may be less spaces than they believe, but certainly not less spaces than we are required. Um, the open land concession, yeah, it is a large concession because the land that was there prior was not part of our development at all. I know he, Mr. Houston wants to refer to it as not being a concession, but it was a completely different person that wanted to develop that property. We convinced him to put it as part of ours. It was a comment that, that the commission wanted to know what was happening on that land. We were not trying to take advantage of that land in some way. It was just there. When the questions came up about it, it was clear that it was an important site. So to solve that, we went back and, and talked to that developer. Also about the authority or the purview of the HCRC, and I know it was talked about over many, many times, but I think it's important to note that the downtown design guide is its own document. The UDC clearly states that you go to the G, downtown design guide, to talk about the purview that works. That is separate from how historical um, views and procedures go for that. Um, as far as public outreach, this architect was hired officially at the beginning of January, end of December, beginning of January. On January 9th, I sent out an email to the Dignity Hill President and President of the Park to say, look, we, we're going through a new process of getting hired a new architecture firm. We'd like to talk to you about that. On January 12th, we were told this is too big an issue for us to talk to you about it just ourselves. We'd like a public forum for that, which resulted in a town hall running through the city councilman's office for February 5th. So we reached out, like I said, we reached out on January 9th to, to engage the public in that process. We had a town hall meeting. It didn't happen the way we wanted it to, but then we go to the town hall meeting and engage the public at that level as well. There are, I think you've heard, so many folks don't want anything. And one of the ways I can say that is because a one-story building, we have a diagram that shows it, certainly the two-story building blocks the view. The view is blocked, and even if you bring it all the way down, the difference between a four-story and five-story at that view from the Mar Cherry is exactly the same. 
it blocks the view, and a 16 foot building blocks that view completely. So, two story, four story, five story is the same result. And so, the only way to preserve that view would be to have nothing, which is what many people want. So, 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 I told you all at the beginning of this that there would be no such demonstrations interrupting speakers, your own, or anybody else. You all have had three and a quarter hours for us to hear what you have to say, and we need to hear what the other folks have to say because we can't hear them through that. Well, if I could uh, also point out some clarifications to some of the uh, misinformation that was shared earlier. Uh, although I think that we're all moved by uh, the great interest and passion that we see by all the folks here today, uh, it, it wasn't all accurate. Uh, for instance, uh, we do have, uh, I know you're here, 25 parking spaces, not 75. Uh, if you look at the exhibit uh, the package, we show underground parking, which is a great expense to pitch. Uh, we're also uh, increasing the building from four to five stories in the sole interest to move massing away to shuffle uh, units that were previously closer to the bridge and four stories away. So the area that's closest to the bridge and actual uh, uh, Pratt uh, and Liberal sections is only one story with the many on top of it. That was a uh, big move that we deliberated it. Mitch wasn't sure that was the right thing to do, but it, it comes at great cost to him. Uh, going on point four uh, makes uh, the building more expensive and fall under some different uh, fire codes and things. But it was the right thing to do to get out of respect for the bridge. So that's the only reason the building is now five stories. And it wasn't uh, to, to poke anyone in the eye or anything like that uh, to, to make the asthma sound much worse from four to five. That was a deliberate strategy in helping that massing. Uh, with respect to a lot of the uh, UDC sections that were cited, and that those are for historic districts or historic property. Now, here we've gone through great lengths. Uh, uh, now, it, is the design a uh, great design? Hell yeah. Is it a Fisker Wing, Zaha Hadid, you know, what you appropriate to say? Probably not. Uh, Adolf Luz, I have not heard someone cite Adolf Luz. He would love this movie uh, with his uh, lack of ornamentation and such. That being said, uh, we're ready to entertain questions and comments. I have a couple of questions for Jackie. Here in your remarks, here in your remarks, you reference the long low building as the context of the immediate area. So explain how. This is contextual and kind of matches that existing context. What we did is we looked around. Uh, you know, certainly there, there aren't any five-story buildings uh, within the block. If you get further up, uh, the Sutton building has a uh, six- and seven-story building, very low floor for heights. Uh, that's not really a good person to point to. Every other building has a proportion uh, that's a, it has a long bar, and so we took our mass, uh, as you've seen. And broken it down into a series of stacked low bars and taken the predominant view across Cherry uh, and employed, you know, the pushing and pulling of that mass added to the subtractive elements to really isolate these different elements into that uh, same sympathetic proportion. Thanks. Uh, can you also explain how the design went? Sure, sure. Uh, as I said just a minute ago, uh, the, the building was four stories and it was a C when we first looked at the, the old design. Uh, and so what we did was rather than have just a, a four-story building that even at its closest point to the bridge, which uh, is presently over the, what is the restaurant area, uh, that was four stories tall. We felt that was uh, imposing uh, too much of its mass uh, in proximity to the uh, to the bridge. And of course, we looked at lots of different precedents, including the buildings in the adjacent to the bridge now. Uh, even looked at the standard uh, hotel in New York City uh, by the, uh, the, the Skyline project there, uh, the Highline, pardon me. And so we then massaged, we, we pulled the mass back to one story 
uh, in that area um, substantially. And that we took those units and put them on top of the building uh, for the rest of the area. So that's that's went from four stories to five in those areas. Closest to the bridge is one. At our ERC, we've had a conversation about moving that lowest part of the south bar to the adjacent street or the senior carriage street uh, so that as it fronted the low lying residents immediately adjacent, that that may have been a better solution for that bar. So, why did we choose not to pursue that uh, design? Well, we did. We did. The idea was to incorporate all those good comments, and uh, to varying degrees, all that's been incorporated. In essence, we've taken the scale uh, of the buildings across the street and translated them into a column brick base, the end bases of the modulated as well. Uh, I think you heard uh, from uh, Monica earlier in uh, very comments uh, saying that 16 feet and 12 feet are too tall for flies. Well, 12 is the minimum we can get at uh, certainly those historic homes if they're at least 12. Uh, and we are required by the downtown design guideline on the first floor to uh, be at least 14 feet from floor to ceiling. So we're, we're kind of fixed into that. Uh, the height of the building is about 7 feet, so it's 16 feet. Well, I'll probably tear up the screen with the mechanical. Uh, if the building uh, the property does drop off uh, as you get away from uh, the bridge, so the intersection of the Lamar and Cherry is a little bit uh, taller, about uh, 3 feet. And as you work your way down, uh, to the west, it's a little bit of uh, a taller there as well. We were able to exploit that uh, topography to, to work in the, uh, the parking as we had. Well, we have a live 3D model for you guys want to come around. So. Uh, I have a question Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at the 3D model right now, and I don't see uh, the design strategies that we've discussed being implemented in this design. Uh, I see the amenities being first story the amenity space back behind the building, not on the carriage where you find the Mr. Chairman, can I interrupt just briefly? Uh, you, we might want to take just a couple minute break and see if we can get this figured out so that the public can see what you guys are looking at. I think that's fine. All I have to do is announce that we'll take a five minute break and then we'll resume in five minutes. Okay. 